people. So welcome to designing an accessible course syllabus. The course syllabus is an essential component of our course. It should be precise, clear, and accessible. It's often the first means of communication between us and our students. Um, a well-designed, accessible syllabus follows universal design principles for learning, and it benefits all students. So in this workshop, we're going to talk about tools to help you create a well-organized and accessible course syllabus, and we're going to expand what we mean by accessible as well to include um, other forms of accessibility other than just accessibility for students with disabilities. Although that is, um, I'm your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers. I am the teaching and learning coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Um, I'll be taking questions throughout the end of the the presentation. So if you have any questions related to what we're covering, feel free to post that to the chat thread. Um, or to raise your hand and you, you can speak uh, using your microphone and I'll address any questions as they come up. And in the text chat, uh, just tell us what your department or division is, what's your role, what do you hope to get out of this workshop? So I'll give you just a second to do that. And then in addition to that, if you want to just share a little bit of a check-in, I do this with my students when I'm teaching um, synchronous sessions just to get sort of an emoji of how you're doing today. Um, and you can share an emoji. There's a, it's a select emoticon right next to the bold I think, underline the, the text box there for the chat. Um, so just share an emoji of how you're doing right now. Um, and I do this with my students because then I can kind of gauge where everybody's at, um, where, where they're at in their headspace, how they're doing. So if someone's maybe not having a great day, you know, they might not be participating as much. So I'm aware of those issues um, without getting into too much detail or, or asking them to reveal too much to everybody. Um, so we've got Etra. And we've got Earth, Atmosphere, and Environment um, today. Um, some TAs here. Um, so excellent. Thank you for joining today. And I'm sure we've got many more, hopefully, watching this afterward, too. Uh, we've got some pod positive emojis going on, which is great. All right, so let's talk about our workshop objective. So in this workshop, we're going to talk about some practical strategies for identifying the benefits of universal design for learning, um, distinguishing between non-accessible and accessible elements of the syllabus, using some basic tools and strategies to create an accessible syllabus. And we won't get into too much detail on that, but I'm going to kind of go over what tools we have through the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning that are accessible to you so that you can look at those tools and those strategies to create your accessible syllabus, um, but also assess the syllabus experience for students. So what is navigation like, for example? What is the tone of your syllabus? Do you incorporate inclusion? And then finally, we're going to emphasize growth and asset in our syllabus. So we'll talk just briefly about universal design for learning. And a little bit of background and foundational information for us here. Um, so with universal design for learning, the design of instruction is usable to all students without the need for adaptation or specialized design. It's not accommodation. Uh, it's meant to benefit all students. Um, so it can be applied to the overall design of instruction as well as specific instructional materials such as the syllabus. Um, so universally designed curriculum provides students 
that have a wide range of abilities or disabilities or, or backgrounds or language skills or learning styles, uh, multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. So the origins of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, uh, UDL provides a framework to create and implement lessons with flexible goals, methods, materials, and assessments that support learning for all students. And universally designed curriculum learning happens in the interaction between the individual and the environment or the transaction between those two things. So uh, universally designed curriculum is social and contextual. Um, for that reason, it's important to understand how a person's knowledge shifts and changes as they interact with their environment. So a single class might include students who struggle to learn for any number of reasons. That can include a learning disability, it can include a sensory disability or a physical disability, um, an English language barrier, a cultural barrier, a custom barrier, emotional or behavioral issues, or limited, limited access to or experience with technology. So universally designed curriculum is providing for those learners, those wide range of abilities or ages or disabilities or backgrounds so that everyone has an equitable learning experience. So what does this have to do with the syllabus? Uh, the syllabus gives students a first impression about what to expect from their learning environment in your class. And it's an opportunity for each one of us as learning facilitators, as instructors, to set up our class climate, to identify our specific learning expectations, and then to discuss our options and accessibility as well. Um, and I'll share this link to planning the syllabus on the UDL website with you in the chat here. So um, on that page, you would find information about the different components of universal design for learning and how they connect to the syllabus. Um, so for the recognition network, we start from the left, providing multiple means of representation. So we're going to be explicit about the ways in which students can access our content, textbooks, slides, our course website videos, where to find background information, and give students some examples there. For the middle there, the strategic network, we're providing multiple means of action and expression. We're using the syllabus to communicate our regular routine so that we can establish expectations for our students to outline the timing and the format of our assessments to offer resources for um, students to be able to manage information. And then finally, the affective network. Um, so we're providing multiple means of engagement with this. We're outlining our learning goals and objectives. We're outlining the relevance of the content and any opportunities for choice within our course. For example, choice for um, how they want to be assessed. So writing a term paper versus creating a presentation or doing a multimedia project. So let's talk about accessibility specifically. So one way that we can accommodate students is to include resources and statements that address students with differing needs. Um, so these are just some examples of those statements or, or those resources that we can provide students with. So the Americans with Disabilities Act statement, um, bystander intervention, Disability Resource Center, et cetera. So our, our campus welcomes all students. We are committed to providing a range of specific student needs, needs and accommodations. Um, and the U.S. Department of Education and Higher Learning Commission actually requires that all courses have a syllabus that's made available to each student who's enrolled in their course by that first class meeting. So at a minimum, regarding student accommodations, all syllabi, at least at our campus and NIU, we have to include the Americans with Disabilities Statement, the ADA Statement. Um, but you can also add a statement requesting that students with disabilities contact you regarding, regarding their accommodation needs um, and point them to the Disability Resource Center for official accommodations. Um, the other ways that NIU accommodates its students, um, and we have the examples of these statements and resources on our syllabus toolkit, which I'll show you around in a bit. Um, you could also include, you know, any personal statements that you want to include, any inclusive, inclusive statements, something about how student success is important to you, um, that any student who has a circumstance that might have some impact on their work in the class and might require special accommodations for to contact you early in the semester so that you can make those accommodations for them in a timely manner. 
and I will provide you with some links to these resources um, in my follow-up email as well. So there are some other statements to consider using in our syllabi, um, including these inclusive statements. Um, so we've got the NIU Office of Academic Diversity and Inclusion has a, an online faculty toolkit where you can find a range of inclusive statements that we recommend that you include in your course syllabi. Um, so it provides some resources on navigating classroom dynamics, creating culturally responsive teaching. It's not required to be included on your course syllabus, um, but including these statements can provide, you know, an educational experience that um, includes everyone and can create that tone for your course. So let's take a look at the syllabus full kit. So I'm going to share. Stop sharing this and then start sharing my screen so that I can All right, so this is our syllabus toolkit and I'll share the link to this. Um, so we've got an accessible syllabus guide. We've got a course syllabus guide. We have a workload estimator. This is really helpful for if you're trying to decide, you know, how many pages of reading to assign in a week. Um, this kind of give you an estimator of how much the workload is for the class. Make sure that it's a reasonable workload for your students. Um, there's also the syllabus checklist, syllabus statements, and success guides. So I'll go through each one of these. Um, so this is the what I mentioned before about um, some tools for you to create an accessible syllabus um, that's accessible for students who use screen readers, for example. Um, so using creating an accessible syllabus in Word uses um, style headings or heading styles. Um, so you can kind of scroll through this, talks about lists and tables, um, links. Uh, so if we're using meaningful link titles, this is more um, if you're going to be sharing this as a, a, an online document, which most of us do now. If you're going to print out your syllabus, you might want to include the URL. Actually, you should include the URL for a printable syllabus. Um, you know, if you're going to be handing out hard copies of a syllabus, if that's something that you do, um, then you want that URL because they can't click on a piece of paper. Um, but if, you know, you're sharing this uh, online on Blackboard, then, you know, use meaningful link titles instead of click here or using the URL, because if someone's using a screen reader for that, um, it's going to read out that entire URL. Um, and it's not, not going to be a very pleasant learning experience <laughs> for the student. Um, it also talks about images here, columns. Um, there's the accessibility statement that's required for all NIU syllabi. And then also about checking accessibility, where there's a check accessibility feature in Microsoft Word. Um, and then an, you can, all, it also talks about PDF conversion. Um, so some of the concerns around converting into a PDF. Um, and then if you really do need, need or want your, your syllabus to be PDF, how to make it accessible. Because just saving as a PDF does not necessarily make your document accessible to students with disabilities. Um, so there's some additional resources there at the bottom and also learning more about technology accessibility, a link there. Um, so the next guide that we have is our course syllabus guide. It talks about creating the course syllabus, student-centered syllabus, which I'm going to talk about um, today as well, creating a learning community, developing your syllabus, what your goals and learning objectives are. And sometimes, you know, I know as a TAs, I was a TA at NIU for seven years. So I know you, you know, departments sometimes have learning objectives uh, for your course that are already set. Um, but you might have some control over, um, you know, your module objectives or your unit objectives um, and connecting those to the overarching course objectives. Um, also designing around those learning outcomes, how you can shape your course schedule around those outcomes, um, activities, grading system, textbooks. Um, and something to keep in mind with textbooks is that our, we have open educational resources 
resources and materials available through the university library. So there's a to guide there. Um, so that's one way that we can make our courses more accessible to students is by using free or low cost course materials. Um, it also talks about the course syllabus and then some more nuts and bolts on developing your syllabus there um, and the layout. So another, so I mentioned the workload estimator. I'll give you a kind of a little view of that. Um, so you can look at what's the class duration, how many pages per week, what's the page density. So that'll account for different um, types of texts that you might have them read, difficulty and purpose, um, looks at writing assignments, videos and podcasts, discussion posts, exams, um, and then you can end class meetings and you can estimate the workload for your course and make sure that it's reasonable for students and doable. There's also a syllabus checklist here that includes all the things that you need to have in your syllabus. There are the syllabus statements that I mentioned. So the will only run this required is the ADA statement. Um, there's also a bunch of other statements, some general statements, as well as some inclusion statements and statements that are specific to online or hybrid courses. So definitely re um, recommend taking a look at those um, and considering including those in your syllabus too. And then there's also some success guides here on being productive, studying smarter, reading better, being active in class that you can share with your students. Um, you can share this as a link um, for your students in your Blackboard course. You can share this as a link also in your syllabus um, and go over it with students. So any link that you include in your syllabus or in your course, I would go over with students, show them that link, don't rely on them to find it and just magically click on it and know what it is. So that's the syllabus toolkit. And I will start sharing my PowerPoint again. Oops. Can't do it too far. All right, so making your syllabus accessible. So what is accessibility? Just generally, it means making sure that your content's available to as many people as possible, especially individuals with hearing, visual, and cognitive disabilities who often use assistive technologies. So beginning on January 18th, 2018, NIU implemented a policy for producing, developing, maintaining, and using technology. Um, and I'll share that with you in the chat. Oops, go back there. Um, and hopefully that link works. I did not double check that. But um, if it doesn't, I will send you an updated link. So all electronic and information technology has to be accessible to people who have visual or hearing disabilities or who cannot use a mouse or a keyboard. So that applies to everything from online course materials to videos shown in class. Thank you, Anika. Um, or assigned outside of class to web applications like MyNIU, things like Blackboards, to copy your printers. So even if you haven't had a student who is blind, for example, or who has vision or who is hard of hearing or is, who is deaf in class, now is always the time to make all of our course materials accessible. And the DRC, the Disability Resource Center, can work with you to, for example, caption videos to create accessible documents um, when you need them. We don't want to just wait until we have a student who identifies or presents themselves to us with a disability to make our, our course materials accessible. Because then we're going to have to you know, do a whole lot of work in a short period of time to do that rather than just making our, our work um, accessible from the start so that we don't have to worry about that. We already know that anybody can access our course materials. Um, so I did point out in the toolkit the um, accessibility checker utility in Microsoft Word. There's also an accessibility checker in Adobe Acrobat X Pro. And if you work for NIU, you should be able to um, talk to IT about getting that um, installed on your work computer. Um, 
because we do have a license for Adobe Acrobat X Pro. So that's if you want to make um, your PDF files more accessible. So just some quick tips for accessibility in documents. We always want to add alternative text to images, to pictures, clip art, charts, table shapes, embedded objects, video, audio files. That provides an audible description of any non-text object when an individual who's using a screen reader hovers over that image with their cursor or their screen reader is going through it. It'll read that image. Um, it's also shown, uh, alternative text is also known as alt text. Um, in most programs, you can right click on an object or on an image and then select format to enter the alternative text. Um, or you might have to press F1 or help to find out how to enter that alternative text. Um, styles also are mentioned in the toolkit that's using whatever your word processing programs built in or custom style menus are when you're creating headings um, and lists and using them. Um, to organize your syllabus, particularly um, in Microsoft Word, if you use style uh, for headings, then your students can actually view um, the navigation pane and they can see all of the headings, click on a heading and go to that part um, of your syllabus. So that's something neat to show your students too. They might not know that they can do that. So you can show your students, hey, if you need to find information about X, go here look at the navigation pane, click on a link, and you'll go straight to that part of your syllabus. Um, uh, also, using column header rows tables is important. Meaningful hyperlinks, as was already mentioned, so uh, descriptive text rather than hyperlink um, text, URL text, uh, avoiding using blank cells for formatting or paragraph marks or spacing between lines or paragraphs, too, because that can create a stutter sound on a screen reader that can become really annoying for our students who are using screen readers. Um, we also want to include closed captions for all audio files. Um, so make sure that anytime you're including an audio or a video file that it is captioned. Um, captioning is best because then they can see the captioning as they're looking at the video. Transcripts are also nice, but they don't have the benefit of uh, lining up with the video while they're watching. So um, also utilizing the accessibility check tools. Um, in most programs, they have accessibility checks. And we already talked about Microsoft Word having that um, and Adobe Acrobat Pro X. Um, and then also adding a space or a small image or text box at the start of the document with an accessibility disclaimer. So that tells readers who and where to, to contact for assistance with that document if they have any difficulty reading or understanding it. So some additional accessibility considerations that I want to go over are not specifically about um, students with disabilities, but more about accessibility in terms of inclusion. So one of the things that um, makes a syllabus accessible is when we design it for the ease of finding information. Um, using those styles, the, the heading styles, definitely helps with that. Um, you know, some when I found that I got a lot, lot fewer questions um, on course policies or things that students could find in the course syllabus. When I started organizing the information in my syllabus, not by what I thought was the order of importance of that information, because that's not intuitive for students. So if they need to find information, the easiest way for them to do that is if the information in my syllabus is in alphabetical order. So I try to keep my headings in alphabetical order. I keep you know, some of the same things on the front page, contact information, course information. Uh, course outcomes, those kinds of things, um, you know, course textbooks, those things can stay on the first page. But then once I get that kind of nuts and bolts stuff out of the way, then the rest of my course policies, I personally like to put in alphabetical order. And then I also show my students how to use the navigation pane in Microsoft Word to navigate the document as well. So they have a couple of different ways of navigating that. But design for the ease of finding information. Make sure that 
if a student has a question, yes, it's in the syllabus, but if our syllabus is 17 pages long, are they going to reread the entire 17 pages to try to figure out where that information is? Or how can we best design our syllabus document so that students who have a question can easily find that information? Um, something else that we want to think about is growth and asset mindset. So these are two different things related. So growth mindset conveys to students that the instructor believes they can grow their abilities if they put in the time and the effort, they use success strategies, if they reach out for help when they're struggling. An asset mind mindset sees all students, this is more of like our mindset uh, as instructors. So we see all students as capable of learning. We still have high expectations, but we see them as capable of learning and we want to use students' strengths to help them succeed with our challenging curriculum. So for this asset mindset to work, we need to get to know our students well enough that we can help students see their own strengths and their existing knowledge and work with that. So see them as valuable resources, not just as vessels to fill with our knowledge, but they have their own existing knowledge uh, and skills as well. So in other words, our asset mindset is looking at our students and what they bring with them as strengths, embracing those strengths and experiences, and then helping them move forward with high expectations. On the other hand, we have deficit mindset, which is focusing on what students lack. So in other words, we're looking at their weaknesses and not what they have to offer. Yes, we do want to find out where their deficits are so that we can address those, but we don't want to see them as just deficits. We want to have that growth mindset. We want to see, okay, well, here are some gaps in our knowledge. How can we use your strengths to improve your learning um, and get you to grow? Uh, a fixed mindset is believing that intelligence and ability are innate and that we can't change it. Syllabi that utilize the fixed mindset messaging convey that some students can do it, some can't, and there isn't much that can be done to change that. And that's not the message that we want to send to our students. That kind of message disproportionately affects our structurally and our historically marginalized students. So we want to, we want to communicate to students in some that they can grow in their abilities if they put forth that time and the effort, if they come to us for help when they're struggling. And we also want to assert that we see them as capable of learning, but we also see that they bring strengths and they bring knowledge to the table. Another thing that we want to do in an accessible syllabus is to be intentional about our tone. We want to communicate respect for our students. Um, so students from historically marginalized groups might question whether we're going to treat them fairly in our interactions, in our grading, and our evaluation of them. And policies that communicate respect and care for them can lessen that social identity threat for the students. Um, so in addition, we want to take the diversity and the complexity of our students' lives into account when we're, we're crafting our syllabus. When our policies assume that all students are sharing the same identities or the same lived experiences. Our students from underrepresented or historically marginalized groups can feel like they're not seen, they're not valued in that learning environment. So by acknowledging our diverse student experiences in our course policies and integrating some flexibility into those policies that provide for reasonable accommodations to meet the needs of various student circumstances, we can show our students that they're valued in our classrooms. So some of the strategies um, for being intentional about tone in our syllabus include expressing through our syllabus tone and how we quote unquote, speak to students in our syllabus that we're approachable, that we want to help them succeed. Um, so, you know, we can say, you know, why did the student might come up to us, oh, I didn't understand that assignment, that's why I did it poorly on it. Um, well, why didn't you come and talk to me? Well, let's take a look at our syllabus. Let's take a look at how we're presenting ourselves to students. Are we presenting ourselves as approachable um, to students? Are we communicating to students that we want them to succeed? Um, and are we opening up channels of communication for our students? They can come to us when they don't understand something or when they need more time on something um, and they feel like we might be receptive to that um, and we're not going to shut them down. Um, another strategy is communicating that we care about students 
not only as learners, we care about them as learners, we want them to learn, we want them to succeed, but we also care about them as people. We see them as people uh, because they are people. They aren't just, you know, names on a roster. They're humans. They have lives. They have their own unique circumstances, their own backgrounds, their own experiences that they bring to the classroom that complicates the classroom experience for them. Um, so we want to make sure that we they understand that we care about them. And that also is going to make it more likely that they approach us when they're having difficulties. Um, also, we want to convey, and this is kind of going along with the growth and the asset mindset, we want to convey to students that they belong in our courses. Uh, so we don't want, for example, a syllabus statement that says, um, you know, this course is really difficult. If you, you know, aren't up to it, then you should just drop out now. Like that's not conveying to students that they belong in our course. And that's not showing students that we care about their success, that we want to see them succeed, and that we are going to be their partners in that success. Because that's part of our job as educators is to help students cross that finish line, um, to get them to the place where they can um, achieve those course objectives. That's course objectives. So we want to convey to students that they do belong in our course. Um, and that might be, you know, uh, something that we do overtly. Um, we might be sending, you know, uh, subtle messages to students through certain ways that we phrase things in our syllabi that give them the impression that they don't belong in our course. So we want to take a really close look at how we are saying things to students in our syllabus uh, and making sure that we aren't discouraging students with our tone and with the language that we use in our syllabus that we aren't maybe saying to certain types of students, hey, you should probably just drop out of this course right now because you're not going to be successful because that's not something that we want to convey to students. We want to convey to all of our students that they belong in our course. Um, we also want to value the wealth of students' diversity and experience and perspectives, and that goes along with the asset mindset. Um, so, you know, valuing their experiences, their perspectives, allowing them to bring that into the classroom and to share that with their peers, to share that expertise that only they have, um, and to learn from each other in addition to learning from us. Um, also, we want to normalize that students are going to face challenges in our course and in general. Um, and we also want to normalize seeking support and utilizing resources available to help students overcome those challenges. So students who are from, you know, historically, mar um, historically marginalized um, groups might feel hesitant about seeking support or utilizing resources that are available to them because they they might you know feel already feel like they don't belong um, and we want to, to alleviate those feelings um, to make them feel like they do belong but you know they might be feeling like they, like they don't belong and so they might avoid seeking that support or utilizing those resources that might help them because they don't want to be seen as not belonging so i think we need to really normalize that all of our students are going to face challenges of course and also normalize that hey you should seek support you should use these resources that are available to you to help overcome those challenges everybody uses these resources. Um, so, you know, making sure that that students know that that's normal, that it's not just them, that they do belong, um, and then hopefully they will take advantage of those resources and seek out that support. Uh, and then finally, um, I like to, I, I've been guilty of this myself, <laughs> including a laundry list of blaming statements or should nots based on my students' past behavior. You know, I have you know, this problem in this class, so next semester I'm going to put that in my syllabus so that I don't have that problem again. But what that just ends up becoming is this bloated syllabus with a bunch of blaming statements or a bunch of things that students shouldn't do. Um, and what that says to students is, I assume that you're going to do this bad thing, um, so don't do this bad thing that I assume you're going to do. It's not giving students the benefit of the doubt. It's not welcoming to students. It's not um, you know, approachable. <laughs> it's not showing that you care about students. So we want to give our students, our current students, the benefit of the doubt. We don't want to admonish them for our prior students' perceived transgressions. We want to have, you know, policies um, that are going to 
kind of help us create a welcoming and safe space for our students. Um, but we don't want to just start going crazy about with uh, a bunch of policies based on, you know, this one class I had this problem with or this one student did this one thing. So now I got to put that in my syllabus and make sure that nobody else does that. Um, so we want to make sure that our syllabi are, you know, the tone of our syllabi is, is caring, is approachable, and conveys belonging to our students. Um, you know, we can set parameters for, you know, code of conduct. We can link students to our code of the NIU's code of conduct. Um, but we also want to extend grace to our students and give them the benefit of the doubt and tell them, you know, I trust that you're going to um, be a partner in your learning. Um, another thing that, and like part of this got, of course, <laughs> um, obscured here, but we want, another thing that we want to do in an accessible syllabus is to promote identity safety. So in an identity safe classroom, Students from diverse identities and backgrounds feel welcome. They feel valued. They feel respected. They feel like they're recognized as having the potential to succeed, that they're less likely to experience social identity threat, which is the, the concern that they're going to be viewed in terms of negative stereotypes rather than their identity as an individual person. Um, so socially ident social identity threat can be provoked by either subtle or overt messages about who is likely to be successful in our class, or, or even by just the lack of peers or instructors or discipline professionals or, or experts in our, our field that share a student's group membership. So if we're always showing you know, students um, in our STEM courses, white men, as discipline professionals um, and experts in the field, then how likely are they to feel like they belong in that environment? We need to show them um, that they can be successful as well. So experiencing identity threat um, as a result of being negatively stereotyped, so this can be through, you know, overt means or it could be microaggression, um, being underestimated based on group identity, uh, being subjected to a hostile racial climate. This all undermines academic retention and achievement, and it lowers a sense of social belonging. On the other hand, identity safe classrooms that communicate that students are valued, that they're respected, that they're capable of success, improve student learning, and it fosters student engagement. So a few strategies that are going to help us promote identity safety in our classes include establishing norms for course conduct, that include the reinforcement of civil and respectful communication, acknowledging and valuing the diverse identities of our students, providing information on historical and social contexts that have systemically marginalized student groups so we can shine a light on barriers to success that are not students' fault, and then we can work to maybe dismantle those systems as well um, in whatever way we can in our own class. And also using inclusive teaching practices regularly. So not just, you know, having that in our syllabus, but also living that in our courses, right? Um, and then reinforcing those inclusive climate messages throughout the semester. Some pitfalls that we want to avoid when we're promoting identity safety include in, inadvertently creating an unsafe environment by promoting this idea of unrestrained freedom of expression. So we still want we want to have that um, respectful and civil communication. Um, another pitfall is mistaking creating a safe environment with creating an environment in which students are always comfortable. So students aren't necessarily supposed to always be comfortable in an educational environment. They should be challenged. They should engage in self-reflection. That might make them feel uncomfortable at times. Um, so for example, maybe our students might become aware of their unearned privileges and advantages, and that might make them feel a little bit uncomfortable, and that's okay. And that's not um, saying that, you know, our students who do not have those privileges, who are from historically marginalized groups, should feel uncomfortable um, in the classroom uh, because of those, those uh, being marginalized. Um, those are two different things. But we can challenge ideas. We can engage in self-reflection, and that might be uncomfortable at times. And that's how we grow. 
Um, another pitfall to avoid is overcorrecting. So for example, realizing that I call on one type of student uh, a lot and then overcorrecting and then never calling on that type of student um, and calling on a different type of student all the time. Uh, another pitfall might be placing the burden on students from historically marginalized groups to speak for or be a spokesperson for their we don't want to put that burden on our students. Um, we want to focus on students as individuals rather than asking them to be representative of their groups or singling them out to represent their groups and their perspectives. Um, and then another pitfall, final pitfall, is not being open to criticism. So our, ourselves, criticism from students. So if we get defensive, if students point out when our efforts and inclusion are falling short, that doesn't help us grow. We wanna to listen to, we wanna acknowledge, and we wanna address students' concerns. And also recognizing that if students are coming to us um, and giving us this, this feedback, that actually says something good about us because they feel like they can approach us about that. Um, we've created that environment where they feel like they can come to us and express that you know they're not feeling included um, or that we're falling short um, so i think that's you know kind of a positive and a negative um, so they can come to us we need to listen to them we need to acknowledge them and we need to address their concerns and we need to make sure that um, we are constantly reevaluating so we want to just like we're going to um, challenge our students um, challenge maybe their, their preconceptions, engage them in self-reflection, we also need to do that for ourselves. And then we also want to make our syllabus student-centered. So student-centered course policies promote equity in our courses, they communicate respect, they consider the diversity and complexity of students' experiences, and they are created in such a way that fulfilling them doesn't place an undue burden on students from any individual identity group. So developing student-centered course policies is one of the most effective things we can do to promote equity in our courses, ensuring that our course policies and our practices acknowledge and accommodate the lived experiences of diverse student populations can help us close those income gap or outcome gaps um, by helping uh, to ensure that students' engagement and performance isn't negatively impacted by for example, a lack of access to resources and support that's gonna help them succeed, even when their life circumstances present obstacles to education. So our course policies need to acknowledge students' lived experiences. They should be written to work for all students. And that'll help to promote students' engagement in courses by lowering that um, identity threat that we just talked about, by promoting student engagement, by increasing their sense of, of social belonging. Um, and that's particularly true among um, underrepresented or underserved student groups. So to make our syllabi more student-centered, we can follow a few steps. We first want to identify what are our student groups on campus. Our classes are likely going to reflect the broader campus community. So we want to know who's in that community. Um, and then we want to review our course policies through the lens of each of those student groups to make sure that we're not inadvertently disadvantaging or burdening students from historically marginalized groups. And if we have trouble with that, sometimes we can't see past our own identities. If we have trouble with that, we can you know, have a few students, some of your former students or um, your GAs, um, fellow GAs or other faculty, uh, take a look at your syllabus to see where there might be some equity issues there, um, where we might be blinded to those, those subtle issues in our policies. We want to then um, omit policies that are inequitable and or add policies that address unmet needs of student groups. So for example, if we've got a lot of students who are caregivers um, in whatever way that, that is, they either have children or they're taking care of younger siblings or they're taking care of older family members, how might we craft our course policies to help them succeed despite the challenges that they might have um, with that caregiving responsibility? And then finally, we want to compose course policies with which students can actually comply. So in an ideal world, all students will be able to submit their work on time every time. In the real world, life circumstances and challenges happen. So how can we craft a late work policy, for example, that actually works for students and for us, and that takes you know, the messiness of life into account? 
So I have heard some concerns um, in my role talking to faculty about course policies. Um, and one of them is, uh, especially around student-centered course policies, one big question is whether these kinds of policies sacrifice quote unquote rigor in our courses or are not holding students accountable. So when we're considering that question, I think we need to identify what our real goal is for course assignments and policies. Is it to hold students to some arbitrary standard of behavior? Or is it to accurately assess students' learning and mastery of course concepts? I think it's the latter. Um, but also we need to consider what we mean by rigor. So by rigor, do we mean challenging course content? Or do we mean challenging course logistics? We want to challenge with our content. We don't want to challenge them with the logistics of the course. Um, so we don't want to make it difficult for them to learn. We want them to be given all the tools that they need to learn this challenging content that we're giving them. And then in regard to accountability for students, student-centered policies aren't designed to just let students off the hook. They're designed to provide a reasonable measure of flexibility so that students can reach their potential and so that their academic success isn't undermined by obstacles that are outside of their control. So basically, we're providing grace for students, changing our expectations for the quality of their work, or we're not changing our grading standards, we're just removing barriers to student success that are predicated on their life circumstances. So we're actually going to get a more accurate picture of student learning when we employ these student-centered course policies. Another concern is that student-centered policies let students get away with something, or they're letting them pull one over on us. So ultimately, these policies are not a free-for-all. There are limits. So for example, curbing how many late submissions students can turn in. So introducing some flexibility to account for student circumstances, but we're not introducing so much flexibility that we spend more time chasing down students missing work than actually teaching our courses. Um, so, you know, we're giving all of our students the same number of, for example, late submissions, and then we put the onus on them to choose when they um, take advantage of that, when, when their life circumstances require them to turn something in late and utilize one of those those late submissions. Um, another concern is cheating. And actually, student-centered policies might actually help reduce cheating because students, usually students are resorting to cheating because they run out of time, they're afraid of failing, they feel a pressure to do well, they don't understand the assignment. So if we have student-centered policies that are providing students with opportunities to ask questions or give them more time to seek help or just when they're feeling overwhelmed, they might be less tempted to cheat, actually. And then finally, a big concern that I've heard multiple times when discussing course policies with faculty is that we need to teach students quote unquote professional skills and that these student-centered policies conflict with that. For example, professors might be worried about offering extensions on assignments or accepting late work because quote unquote in the real world, when students are working, they're gonna be required to adhere to these deadlines. But in reality, employees can ask for extensions in a professional environment and managers tend to be receptive to those requests within reason. In addition, there are other skills that we're helping students develop when we have these student-centered course policies. For example, resilience, self-advocacy, effective communication, time management. So I think we often think, oh, well, we need to, we need to have these course policies because we need to teach students, you know, how to, you know, meet a deadline. Well, you know, in the real world, in real corporations, you know, you have a deadline, yes, but you can also talk to your manager, um, your supervisor. You can say, hey, I'm, I've got this deadline coming up next week and, you know, I really want a little bit more time to work on that. So can I have a few extra days? And generally, as long as it's not at the last minute and it's not a result of, you know, you not doing your work, <laughs> um, they're going to be receptive to that. So I think that um, we really need to, to consider our course policies in terms of what we really want students to learn, what we're really measuring, um, what we're assessing in student learning. All right, so um, if anyone has any questions, you can post it to chat, you can raise your hand and use your microphone. Um,
And like I mentioned, I will send a follow up email with some resources um, and some some links, especially to the syllabus toolkit that has all of that great information about creating an accessible syllabus um, and about our course policies that gives you examples of those as well. Thanks, Anika. Yeah, the toolkit is great. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm so glad we get to do these workshops and, and you know, post these, we're gonna post these to YouTube um, because, you know, we have all of these great uh, resources and people just don't know that they're there. So hopefully a lot more people will be able to use the syllabus toolkit <laughs> um, uh, through, you know, watching this, this workshop later on or, um, you know, any one of our other ways that we communicate that um, to faculty. Thank you, Brittany, for coming. All right, so if nobody has any questions, then we will um, end for today. Thank you so much for attending today's presentation or for watching this. For the fact, again, I'm Amanda Smothers, and I am the Teaching and Learning Coordinator for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Um, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about accessible syllabi or about teaching in general or instructional technology afterward, and have a great day.